Hi, this is Richard Blade, the voice of Sirius XM's First Wave, and you're listening to the voice of 91 Reasons, Jeff Tucker. Totally awesome. You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, the voice, Jeff Tucker. Turn around, look at what you see. I am honored to be doing another episode from a Patreon pledger, Michael Bondi, who continues to send me uh, lists of uh, his favorite movies and gives me uh, the opportunity to pick which one I want to do. And uh, he always has fantastic movies on his list, so picking one is both easy and uh, quite difficult. Easy because most of the films are modern-day classics. Uh, Difficult because then I have to sit down... And I have to come up with an angle and a way to talk about the film that's decidedly just me. Uh, So what happened is, you know, last month I had to sit through the insufferable food fight, thanks to Patreon pledger Patrick. Uh, And the only way to see food fight is to subscribe to Amazon Prime because they have instant video and they have a big catalog of uh, some current movies, but mostly just filler Mostly just uh, what you rented on a Friday night when all the new releases were checked out. And because I signed up for the full uh, month uh, preview, you know, trial offer, because the full subscription is $99. Oh my God. Uh, but I get, you know, that's for a year. So it's less than $10 a month. So it's on par with Netflix, although they don't have quite the selection that Netflix has. It's not a service I would purchase. Unless it was. I was going to purchase it like around tax refund time. So the $99 didn't sting. Uh, But, uh, you know, at this point, uh, not to be. uh, Only because we're moving and uh, we're trying to save money and uh, turn off services. Not that Amazon Prime is like a bill that comes to your house. But you know what I mean. And to that end, if you hear any strange noises in the background this week, it's because uh, they're redoing one of our bathrooms. So there's a guy here and he's walking on paper right now he's cutting tile i don't know if you can hear that but uh, there's a lot going on but it will not sway me from sitting down to do an episode because um interesting that i started 91 reasons uh just to see if i could do it and now it's almost become uh like therapy to sit down every week and talk to the the invisible listener that I've conjured up and the visible ones that I know and that write me and talk to me or that take me to task like Hendel. Hendel who took me to task on Ready Player One because in my midst of talking as fast as I do, I said that Lord of the Rings was part of 90s culture. Uh, Not true. Uh, Lord of the Rings is 2001, 2, and 3 when the films came out. And the only reason I included them in that sentence and erred by not saying 90s culture and beyond into the 2000s is because Ernest Klein has weighed tooling around most of the novel of Ready Player One in a Serenity class Firefly ship from Firefly that he named the Vonnegut. So I just assume that that's where the Lord of the Rings culture comes from. And if you want to be nitpicky about it, and 91 Reasons is nothing if not nitpicky, right? Uh, Lord of the Rings didn't have visual uh, representation until, I'm not sure exactly when. I know there were maps drawn in the books. But even before the Ralph Bakshi uh, rotoscope nightmare Lord of the Rings movie, uh, I got all of my Lord of the Rings imagery 
from the brothers Hildebrandt. And the brothers Hildebrandt were, or are, I'm not sure if they're still alive or not, uh, incredibly talented and incredibly prolific uh, fantasy painters. They, they did a bunch for Star Wars, but they also did, I mean, before Star Wars, they did a yearly Lord of the Rings calendar. My brother would buy that every year. And I would just, as a kid, marvel at it. And then uh, my, my Lord of the Rings obsession began when uh, a lot of my generations did, and that's the Hobbit uh, animated movie, the um, Rankin-Bass uh, uh, masterpiece Hobbit uh, cartoon that I just think is fantastic. And we had one of those uh, coffee table books for the Hobbit that had a lot of art from it. And some of the pages had plastic overlays so you saw the background that you would overlay on top the uh, characters uh, on almost like a cell drawing I would love to find that book now I haven't thought about it until just a few days ago like trying to figure out where does Lord of the Rings imagery come from if you're not talking about the Peter Jackson films and I know you know like and like like when when somebody that iconic makes it, you know, when when Disney makes Beauty and the Beast, no one gets to make it again without being compared to Disney. When Disney, you know, when Peter Jackson made Lord of the Rings, he set the bar. And most uh, sword and sorcery epics are now going to be uh, compared to Lord of the Rings for the next 50, 60 years until somebody one ups him. And I don't know how you do that because before Jackson's. Uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, Sword and Sorcery, other than what, Conan? Didn't really fly in theaters. Now, I'm the, the guy that went to uh, Dragon Slayer more than once because the dragon in Vermithrax was the most convincing dragon put on screen up until CGI, you know, Dragon Heart. But they're just not, uh, not a lot of big movies, you know. But I did enjoy Lord of the Rings. I even enjoyed the uh, Return of the King cartoon where, you know, because Ralph Bakshi was never able to, to complete the Lord of the Rings animated trilogy like he wanted. And it was up to somebody else, you know. But uh, that one has uh, the great song where there's a whip, there's a way as they're whipping the hobbits. But uh, not to spiral down into... Um, Lord of the Rings, but uh, no, it just, uh, Hiddle was right. My, my, my comment was uh, in error, but uh, the thought behind it uh, just needed more fleshing out, I guess, you know, because the book Ready Player One is 90% 80s and late 70s to some degree culture, uh, but he does let a few things bleed into it, you know, like um, the Firefly and such, so... Uh, it doesn't diminish the power of that book or how much fun it is to read it, but it does um, allow him a little more leeway. So I assume if Wade and, and Artemis are going down to uh, Lord of the Rings planet to fight a campaign for experience points, uh, they're, uh, they're obviously going to be landing on the Peter Jackson version. Uh, I can't imagine they would land on the uh, Ralph Bakshi version. Although, you know, if you compare some of the shots in the Ralph Baxi version to the Peter Jackson version, he blatantly copied them. He's even admitted, yeah, well, the scene where the ring wraiths are leaning over the hollowed out log and the hobbits are hiding under, that's almost verbatim. And he was like, look, Baxi got it right the first time. Why would we not pay homage and copy that? So, But that's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about this week, or this episode, a... Uh, Another fantasy epic and uh, gosh, never ending story. What a bizarre, bizarre kids movie. Uh, I did see never ending story at the drive in. I went to the La Mirada drive in uh, back in what, 1984. Uh, La Mirada drive in has since become the Santa Fe Springs swap meet. I'm not sure how it was moved for, to another city, but say la vie, right? Maybe the city lines are dotted or malleable. I don't know. But uh, no, we went to the drive-in to see uh, Never Ending Story. I'm sure it was a double feature with something else. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, for whatever reason, I never got into this movie as a kid. It could be because I was 12. I was a little old for the audience they were aiming for. Which is absurd when I, when I eventually talk about the content of this movie. 
But when you look at the cover and you see a young boy and the rock biter and the snail, the racing snail, it all looks, it all looks very childish. Um, and it's, you know, you see the, I watched the trailer where uh, Bastion gets the book and goes to the, the attic and reads. It all comes across a little childish. Uh, but that being said, like uh, going back to the drive-in, I think we must have left early because I never remember seeing the end of this movie other than a couple of times on home video, but it never really registered, you know, because you're talking about age 12 and then by 14, I was into Back to the Future and into Girls and fantasy movies didn't really, um, didn't really do it for me except, uh, I'll say that and then say that, yes, I watch Legend and Labyrinth a lot. So maybe I'm fooling myself thinking that I had somehow grown up in those couple of years when in actuality I did not. But I don't remember much or had, I didn't have any um, impact on me personally, that movie, other than seeing it at the drive-in, being aware of it, uh, noting that for a, a, a fantasy movie with that much visual excitement on the screen, uh, amazing it didn't have any merchandise. Where's the merchandise? Where's the full toy line? The Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings had a full toy line from Knickerbocker, one of the most highly sought after toy lines of all time. And yes, I had a Gollum. I traded it from Chris Tinsman for a Walrus Man, and I would kill to have that Gollum now because it's a very expensive and very cool figure. Uh, at one time, the Ring Wraith on his horse from the Lord of the Rings line from Knickerbocker was the most expensive loose action figure of all time. There was a time when that figure sold for upwards of 1500 Like, that's amazing. But no, uh... Never Ending Story had no merchandise, which I find odd, but, you know, it's just one of those films that I think, before I get into the, you know, the, 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 the story of that film, uh, there might have been a few reasons why it couldn't crack the pop culture of uh, America, simply because it's German, it's a German book translated to English, uh, German director, Wolfgang Peterson, um, so when you watch it, it was made in Germany at the time, the most expensive film ever made outside of the U.S. But when you watch it, it does have that weird, almost intangible foreign film vibe. You watch it, it it's the same vibe that the Pippi Longstocking movies give out. You know, and I'd love to find those. Every time you see those on video or DVD, they're very expensive. And Netflix and Amazon only gets the... Uh, crappy 80s remake the american version but the original pippi longstocking those and this one they share kind of the same vibe you know with pippi it's um the fact that their lips don't match because it's overdubbed or it's dubbed in you know now they didn't do that in never ending story but uh wolfgang peterson directing and uh, this is the guy that directed das boot you know the the World War II submarine movie where he kept the cast locked away and they didn't see the sun for the entire shoot. Like, he's a crazy guy. What could have possessed him to want to make a kid's movie? Except maybe he saw that here's a chance to make a kid's movie that's not going to talk down to children. And aren't those the best kid's movies? The best kid's movies, A, you can watch with your parents and they're not bored. B, they don't talk down to kids. And C, they're not afraid to have danger and tragedy in them. You know, that's why Willy Wonka, the first one, is so good. Because Mr. Wonka is scary. You're, you're terrified and also attracted at the same time. You know, the best kids' movies are like that. And Wolfgang Peterson must have saw in this novel a chance to make something with weight. And oh my God, oh my God, does Never Ending Story have weight? If I ever, in my nerd life, dismiss Never Ending Story as either fluff or not worthy of cult status, I was wrong. Because I'll tell you, I clicked on it on Amazon Prime, me and my two sons and my daughter, who were each sitting with either a laptop or a tablet, put it down. 
to watch this movie and it didn't disappoint um never ending story is a masterpiece it's a masterpiece of how to manipulate the audience how to make them feel something how to make a social commentary and at the same time make an exciting fun and whimsical all most important whimsical kids movie because the best kids movies are part whimsy and part pure terror you know wonka puts the kids on a boat and suddenly we're watching chickens get their heads cut off you know what i'm saying so never ending story opens like most of, of these types of movies the kid's mother has died either one or both parents have to be dead in order for the kid to strike out on their own because if kids have both parents they're coddled so you take one or two away that's just that's just generic basic writing in this case the mother has died and the father is a businessman and it's uh, Gerald McCraney major dad himself and uh He's uh, dismissed the kid, and Bastion has to go off to school uh, after his father goes to work. It's a weird thing. Even my kids picked on him. Like, like the dad just leaves, and the kid's home alone, and it's up to him to get to school, right? So Bastion's walking in the big city, and of course, hand in hand with losing your parents, you're also bullied. So th not one, but three bullies chase him and throw him in a trash can. So we've got all the tropes of the put-upon um, hero who is going to have to rise up and not only face his mother dying, but physically face these bullies down in the street. And it is a good setup, you know, and it, and it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long before Bastion is hiding out in an old bookstore where a man is reading a book that he tells Bastion, you have no business reading. This is not for you. And it's funny because the writer in me knows, not knowing this movie as well as I know a lot of other movies, I'm able to be entranced and taken in while I'm watching it, and not just in a nostalgia way, but in a film way. In a film way, if that makes sense. And the whole time the guy's telling him not to read it, it's, he's, he's, he's basically begging him to take it. You know, it's a little boy. You tell him no, that's all they focus on. And the whole movie, the whole movie is encapsulated in a single line of dialogue that is throwaway that he tells Bastion, the bookstore owner tells Bastion. He says, you and you, you don't belong in here. There's an arcade down the street with all the bleep bleep and boop boops that you can handle. Or words to that effect. And in that moment, in hindsight, in that moment, he's telling you what the crux of this film is. The crux of this film is going to come into play later. We'll get back to it. So, of course, Bastion steals the book because who wouldn't? It's got snakes on the cover. It's got an intriguing title, The NeverEnding Story. And more importantly, this guy told you you couldn't have it. So, like the apple... And the tree of knowledge, Bastion must take it and run with it. Ah, but like the snake, the man smiles as Bastion steals the book. He's not angry. He knew it was happening. He goaded him into doing it. So Bastion takes the book to school. And instead of going home, because he knows there's nothing at home, and Dad may take the book, you know, and while we're at it, we're never going to see Dad again. Dad doesn't factor into the movie at all anymore. There's no... Moment between father and son, no moment of realization. The dad has, has, has made his mark in this movie as the absent father, and then he follows through by being absent the rest of the film. So Bastion is left alone with this book. He goes up to the attic because it's obvious through really economical filmmaking, streamlined filmmaking, that Bastion has been up into this attic a few times before because he knows how to get in. He knows where the keys are. He knows not to leave the key. He's brought his lunch. He's in for the long haul. And Bastion's going to end up staying what feels like to me overnight at the school. Or at least very late. So Bastion sets about reading the never-ending story. I mean, you know, it, it gets right to it. 
And the Neverending Story, the fantasy part, kicks in with a bang. And it kicks in with, we meet a few characters of Fantasia. Deep Roy from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who played um, all of the Oompa Loompas. He's there as a very young, dapper man. And uh, there's also his racing snail. And uh, there's a guy, uh, some sort of gnome troll guy who flies around on a bat. And they are joined by a big character called the Rock Biter. And you know what? I'm watching this movie on Amazon Instant Prime. It's HD, full HD. And you know what? These effects hold up. That's the other thing about the never ending story that has to be said is Wolfgang Peterson has got balls of steel. Because he looked at that book and then he made it, he helped translate it into script form. And even though it featured a line along the lines of, and then a character as big as a as a skyscraper rides in on his rock motorcycle scooter and interrupts their meeting because he's massive and you can tell he's a puppet but it doesn't matter because we buy it hook line and sinker the rock biter would not be improved by making him cgi we would lose the weird human part that comes from the guy actually operating him and the rock biter and the other characters of this scene, they all look convincing. They're all real. And they all just sort of engage each other. The rock biter's got a story. And the story is something is coming to destroy Fantasia. And there was used to be a lake by his house, and now it's gone. And they're like, oh, the lake, the lake dried up. No, no, the lake's gone. Where the lake used to be, there is nothing. And that... Not only is it a scary concept for children, but it's a bizarre concept to even present to them to begin with. Because what in your mind do you see? If they tell you there's nothing, do you see space? We haven't seen that in the movie yet. We won't see that till the end. Do we see a black void? Do we see the sky? What do we see when the rock biter says there's nothing there? It's very scary because he's selling it. You know, that silly puppet is acting his rocks off, so to speak. So as Bastion reads the book and we cut back and forth um, so that every, you're never allowed to forget that Bastion is reading the never-ending story. So the characters in the, in the Fantasia section decide to go see the Empress because the Empress who's, you know, the, basically the Wizard of Oz. She's the smartest one in town, and she's going to find a way to stop the nothingness from destroying Fantasia. And when they get there, they are told by the Empress's right-hand man that the Empress is ill, and she's not even coming out. Sorry, no, no one gets in to see the wizard. Not today. I mean, it's very behind the scenes, right? Very cloak and dagger. And I remember seeing pictures of this sequence in Starlog. And this might have been what turned me off because there's a couple of costumes, most notably the big head characters. And you, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They look like walking chess pieces. Um, they're, they're not very good. You know, they're standard costumes of the time. And that's the thing is, it must have been quite, quite a, uh, a task to come up with 30 different races of different characters to inhabit this scene. They basically had to come up with their kid version of the cantina. But instead of drinking, they're all uh, ambassadors there to find out what she's going to do about the nothingness. But uh, the the right-hand man comes out, and our characters are watching from the sidelines. And uh, I read somewhere online that, uh, I guess, E.T. and... Uh, some Star Wars and Mickey Mouse characters are mixed in there, but I, you know, I didn't see them, and I don't have the DVD to go right to that scene. The Amazon Prime interface leaves a lot to be desired. I'll be honest. But the right hand man says that they've already made plans to fight the nothingness, and they've sent all through the lands for the greatest hunter that exists. He hunts the the purple buffalo, I think they say, and uh, he Atreyu is coming to save the day. There's a fun moment where Bastion looks at his school bag, and there's a stitched uh, patch of an Indian uh, attacking a buffalo. So it sets up that 
the never ending story while you read it is painting these visuals, but the visuals that we're seeing are to some degree coming from Bastion's mind because Bastion is the one reading it and Bastion is the one who is translating it from the printed word to the cinema page, so to speak, the screen. So it's very, again, it has a lot of layers. And it's a very difficult and complicated movie for children. But the good news is that it rewards the kids for watching it because it's going to teach them a lesson at the end that is hard to forget. So when Atreo arrives, he's actually a young child. He's basically uh, Bastion uh, uh, superimposing himself into the book. You know, it's it's Neo's uh, Matrix projection of himself. He's uh, Atreo is everything that Bastion is, and Atreo is handsome and brave and uh, knows weapons and fights and is never bullied by anyone and isn't afraid to do anything. So it's the perfect vessel for Bastion to experience the never-ending story through because it's everything that he wants to be, that he dreams of being in his fantasies. And though the people of Fantasia laugh at Atreo, he says that, no, I, I have this amulet and I am the warrior and I will save Fantasia. And the right-hand man, seeing that this is the only one coming to help, sends Atreo off on his quest. And this is an interesting part of the movie because I, uh, while I'm watching, it's not as if um, the guy tells Atreo what the quest is. He just says you're going on the quest to save Fantasia. So it's very vague. And in most movies, we're let in on what the challenges are going to be. Well, in order to do this, you've got to do this, this, and this. The money's in a vault and it's protected by seven layers of protection. You know, in Die Hard, the, the, the lock is on a time lock. It can't be opened locally. Relax, Theo. It's a time of miracles. So when Atreya was sent out and we're not told what the mission is other than a vague save Fantasia, it does raise in me, the writer, a red flag. Now the kids of the audience don't notice because all they see is a cool guy, Atreo, riding this beautiful horse down the boulevard, right? And there's some idea that he's going to, to, to eventually find this incredibly old uh, witch who's going to... Uh, impart to him the secret of saving Fantasia. So it does come into play, but it's not immediately told. And the big moment of the film that rivets the children to their seat is when they're walking through the bog of sadness and the horse becomes sad and is swallowed and dies. And I, I, I can only assume that this scene must have traumatized millions of children because we've just seen a shot of a treo uh on the banks of a river feeding the horse like sugar cubes and it's very um it looks like legend you know it's very serene and pretty and calm it's the calm before the storm and then bang the horse is first he's in danger and you think well it's a treo he's the hero he's gonna save the horse and then he doesn't and the horse dies and Atreo is left, he's left, you know, alone. It's very sad. He's left alone. At the same time, uh, some unspeakable force of evil awakens in a cave and sets off after Atreo. And we're not really sure, like, what, what that is. Other than it's evil and he must keep away from it. It's something with sharp teeth and fangs and glowing green eyes. And he does almost get Atreo, except there's a near miss. And Atreo finally finds the Ancient One who's going to give him the, the, the secret. And it's a really well done scene where uh, a turtle rises up out of the bog. A turtle the size of a football stadium. And basically uh, jerks Atreo around because doesn't want to doesn't want to help this kid. Has been alive so long, doesn't care if it's dead, if it dies. You know, you'll die too, Atreo says. 
And the turtle says, well, that, that would be something then, wouldn't it? And you're given your second dose of hopelessness, the first being the horse, the second being, well, this wizard's false. But she does say, fine, there's somebody that'll help you, but he's 10,000 miles away. 10,000 miles away. And for Atreo, it's hopeless. It's completely hopeless. So we're treated to a series of scenes of, of the journey across Fantasia. They're beautifully done composite shots of live action plates and matte paintings and foreground miniatures. And I'm trying to tell my kids in an age of CGI where it might take a guy a couple of, couple of months to conjure up one of those shots in a computer. Uh, but back when this film was made and everything was practical, that shot might have taken a year. You know, it might have taken a year to get that shot right. And look at it. It looks, it looks flawless. Even my kids remarked on how good it looked because everything's real. Nothing is trying to, to fool the eye into thinking that pixels are somehow tangible. You know, and if they ever remade the never ending story using massive amounts of CGI, it would be going against what the film means. Eventually, all is lost. Um, Atreo's quest is is ended, basically, and it all seems very hopeless. And then a little luck shows up and Falco the luck dragon, who's arguably the most famous character in this movie, uh, whisks Atreo away, and Atreo wakes up. It's very God in the machine. Uh, saves him at the last minute, that sort of thing. And Atreo wakes up, and the luck dragon is like, well, you got lucky, because I'm a luck dragon. It's all very cute. Um, and it's very much needed, because up until this point, the scenes inside Fantasia and the film itself... They get very, very dark. There's nothing but despair. Atreo taking the hero's journey. And you know the hero's journey is the boy will set out. The boy will be given tools. The boy will be given somebody wise to tell him where to go. And then everything will be taken away. The horse dies. He's told to leave his weapons. The wizard has no information. Because eventually, in the hero's journey, it will be up to the hero himself to save the day by himself, for it's not worth doing. Because the journey to manhood is dangerous. And everyone must walk that road alone. And Atreo's walking alone, and Bastion's walking alone by proxy, by reading it. But there is a fantastic scene where... Well, we're getting to it in a minute. We're getting to it in a minute. Atreo wakes up with the luck dragon, and he's being helped by two little gnomes, uh, one who's devoted to science, one to magic and potions. And he's given the next leg. And this is the first indication because at this point, uh, the luck dragon has flown him 10,000 miles to where... Wherever he needs is going to be, you know, the information will be found. I don't remember. Some, I think it's the seventh oracle, I think it's called. But uh, they, we finally get to see it via the, the gnome's, uh, uh, you know, his telescope. It's a very cool sequ uh, sequence. It looks a little like Dark Crystal at this point. Another film that I really enjoyed. Oh, gee, another fantasy film that you enjoyed, Jeff? That you didn't like fantasy films? Well, you know, there's a few. We seem to like all the ones that come out. Can I not argue with myself during the show? I'm trying to do a show here. Just go get something to drink. Okay, I will. So he sees the seventh oracle, the gate. Two enormous sphinxes uh, who are bare-chested, by the way, and their breasts are enormous, complete with nipples. Again, kids' movie, right? We watch a brave and valiant knight try to cross the threshold, only to be blasted to bits because the gnome tells him only those who fully believe in themselves can cross the barrier. Otherwise, they'll be blown to bits. And it's in an inter interesting turn. Instead of taking time to plan his journey, Atreo simply says, I'm going now. I'm not going to bring a weapon. 
I'm just going as me. And Atreo walks it, and he almost makes it unscathed. Except he has a moment of self-doubt. It's a moment of Bastion's self-doubt. And the Sphinx eyes open, but, but Atreo, being the hero that he is, jumps free and makes it. And the gnome is excited. He made it, he made it, but I never got to tell him what's in the next gate. And when Atreo finally reaches the end, he's given the information on how to save Fantasia, but not before what I talked about, the amazing scene. He walks up to a mirror, and in the mirror, he sees Bastion. And Bastion looks up from the page because basically what Bastion has just read is that on the page, Atreo looks into the mirror and sees Bastion, the young boy. And Bastion says, that can't, that can't be right. It's just a book. How can the book be uh, ha- feature me? Did it describe Bastion in the book, I wonder? I bet it did. It was enough to make him throw the book across the room. Or if it wasn't this moment, it was another moment. I know he does that at one point. But it's an interesting thing because it's the first little nod, elbow to the ribs, to the kids in the audience, that Bastion is Atreo. Atreo is Bastion. The two are linked. As he's reading the book, he is experiencing the story. He's making the characters live as he reads. Okay. Okay. So when he reaches the final um, oracle, he is basically told that the only way to save Fantasia is to give the Empress a human name, and that a human must give him the, give her the name. And Bastion, uh, excuse me, Atreo's like, well, how am I going to find a human boy? Well, you have to somehow leave Fantasia, find the edge of Fantasia to find the boy. So it's all very meta. And in the end... Bastion gets on... Bastion. See, they get confused. Atreyu gets on the Luck Dragon and flies in a beautiful sequence that I'm sure every kid in the audience... Imagine you're a kid, 1984. Your mom, your dad takes you to see this movie. It's entrancing. And the visuals are stunning. And then, towards the end, you get a POV shot of riding the Luck Dragon. What kid didn't want to do that? What kid didn't want to enter the never-ending story and become part of it? You know, uh, I looked it up. There's a theme park in Germany called Bavaria Filmplatz at Munich where they have a full-size Falcor that you can take your picture on. Oh, my God. Book me a ticket today. It's not a green... I mean, it is a green screen, but it's not a... You're not on a green blob that becomes Falcor in the 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 the, in the the lens. No, he's fully there. It's him. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. So that flying sequence is just amazing. And they're flying all through, but they can't find the edge of Fantasia. And this is where we reach our our almost ultimate finale. Uh, Falcor flies right into the nothingness. There's a battle, um, a battle of wills, because Atreo has no weapons. And it ends with Atreo being knocked off of Falcor and falling uh, to a beach. And they're separated again. Again, remember, the hero's journey is that everything must be taken away. He must solve this using his wits, using new tools, not the old tools. You know, Luke has to defeat the Emperor using his new lightsaber, not his father's lightsaber. He has to become his own man. So must Atreyu, so must Bastion. So when uh, Atreyu wakes up and can't find Falcor, he, he finds uh, the Rockbiter, who in a very... Um, poignant, very touching scene. And remember, these are puppets. They don't exist. They're not real. And you find yourself emotionally swept up by them. And he basically is lamenting that his giant rock hands weren't enough to save Fantasia or to save his friends. You know, they're all dead. Everybody died. And he's the last one. 
and the nothingness is swirling back there, ready to take him into nothing. And he's ready to go. I mean, he's, he's suicidal because he's lost everything. And Atreo moves into what feels like either a graveyard or a memorial of sorts. And when he looks on the walls, he sees paintings of his adventures. It's very strange. It's as if it's all happened before. And has it? Has it? Because if somebody reads a book twice, hasn't, haven't the adventures already occurred? A used book, if you buy a used book, hasn't somebody else journeyed through those pages? You're not the first person flipping those pages. The adventure's never ending. It really is. So when Bastion, ugh, Atreyu, finally faces the creature that threatened him earlier, the personification of evil, and evil is weak, and evil's like, the last thing I do is I'm going to kill you. But Atreyu's too strong, too strong. And he ends up realizing where he's at. He's at the ruins of the Empress's castle. It's all gone. The nothingness has destroyed it all. And they're floating through space. Fantasia has been destroyed. They're floating through space on the remnants of their dead planet. It's very sad. It's very, um, it's very magnificent as it's presented. Because it could have come across cheesy, but it doesn't. Nothing in the never-ending story comes off as cheesy. It all comes off as very powerful and honest. I think the honesty is what makes it powerful and what makes it so good. And when Atreyu finally meets the Empress, it's a young child. Everybody's young. It's up to the children to save the universe. You know, the old guard is gone. It's up to the kids to carry on the tradition. And basically she says, the only way is to give me a human name. And he's like, but how do you know that? And she says, I knew it all along. And Atreyu is a bit taken aback. What do you mean you knew all along? And she says, well, we knew, we knew before you left. We knew before you left that the only way to save Fantasia was the human must give me a new name. And he says, well, Wait a minute. If you knew before I left, why did you let me go through that? Why did you let my horse die? Why did you put me through that? And she said it's so that the child reading the book will believe in us. Talk about power right there. She's basically saying everything we watched, everything we saw was simply a sham to bring us in to make us care about Fantasia's inhabitants and Atreo. And only through tragedy do we find empathy for him and his situation. Because at the top of the, of the movie, Atreo is boastful. I'm the greatest warrior. If you don't want me, I'll leave. No, we want you. And by the end, he is humbled. He has been to hell and back. He has seen everything he knows and loves taken away and destroyed into dust, including the very planet. And why? So that people will care about him. So that Bastion will have a stake in this story and transcend the pages to give the Empress a new name. And even at the very end, the planet is about to go. And the Empress is saying, unless he, i.e., in parentheses, Bastion, believes in this story, we're all going to die. And that's, that's what the bookshop guy says at the beginning. The arcade's down the street, kid. Go waste your time playing video games. Real stories are in here. And Bastion says, I do read real stories. And he lists all the classics. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Tom Sawyer. So he is a reader. But he's a reader so much that he doesn't believe that the book's actually speaking to him and that the book is saying to him and that's to the children watching, if you don't believe in fantasy, if you don't indulge your imagination, we will lose everything great about our world. We are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. And if you don't believe, if you don't aspire to something more and push yourself 
then life is not worth living. And there's a moment where Atreyu breaks the boundary to Bastion. Bastion believes it now because he now knows that the boy in the mirror was indeed him and that he is Atreyu. And so in the midst of a storm in the real world that mimics the nothingness in Fantasia, Bastion screams into the wind a new name for the Empress. You don't get to see it. You don't get to hear it. I looked it up. Some people say he says Moonchild, but it's under debate. But it doesn't matter. The name itself doesn't matter. What matters is that Bastion, like all the kids in the audience who applaud to bring Tinkerbell back to life, that they believe, that they believe in their dreams, that they believe in fantasy. And in the final moments of the movie, you're not certain what's real and what's not because Bastion doesn't go home. Instead, he goes to Fantasia. And he, he's given as many wishes as a boy can have because the power of the human imagination is limitless. And he dreams and he wishes to ride the luck dragon through the sky. And we are right there with him because we are Bastion. And we believe now. We clap to bring Tinkerbell back to life. We believed in the story of the never-ending story so much that we fought back the nothingness, the stuff in our lives that take away our childlike wonder. That's why they're all children, because they still believe. And some of us adults who are lucky enough to still believe in fantasy and magic, we're the ones who are the caretakers of Fantasia. And not only does Bastion ride Falcor through Fantasia and sees everybody back to life. The rock biter is there, the snail and his rider, the bat and his friend. They're all back. Everybody's here. Everybody looks great. The final moments transcend Fantasia and the luck dragon chases the bullies down the street. We don't know if 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 Bastion's dropped acid if he's had a brain aneurysm, or if it's really happening. Who knows? And does it matter? No, it doesn't. Like Cobb's top in Inception, it doesn't matter if it falls or not. Cobb believes it. Cobb believes he's in the real world. We believe it's real. We want the bullies to get their comeuppance at the hands of a giant flying dragon with a dog's head. Because as crazy as it sounds... The movie, The NeverEnding Story, works on every level. It truly is a masterpiece. And I can't believe I haven't watched it a hundred times since it came out. And that's my loss. But, but like any good story, now it's part of me. When she says, now you're part of The NeverEnding Story, when you watch the movie, you are. When you want to watch it again... We want to watch it again and again. I mean, I know they made sequels, and I'm going to try to get to those, but I, there's no way they're as good as this one. Different directors, different visions, different thoughts, you know? So I'm glad Michael suggested it. I don't know if I would have ever seen this movie in my adult life were it not for his suggestion to watch it. So I'm holding up my iced coffee. Salute, Michael. Pour out some for my homies. Just kidding. I wouldn't waste coffee like that. But uh, a, a, a truly great movie, um, a cult classic. I can't believe even now in the age of retro toy everything, there aren't toys of the rock biter and the snail rider and the empress. and a, I mean, Atreyu? Who wouldn't buy an Atreyu? Reaction, Funko, if you're listening, we want never-ending story. I want an Atreyu. I read the necklace Atreyu wears is hanging in Steven Spielberg's office. Because who better to be the caretaker of the dreams of the modern day kid than Steven Spielberg, right? Peter Pan himself. Peter Pan himself, director of Hook. <laughs> well, so uh, I highly recommend going to watch uh, Never Ending Story. Uh, it's a fantastic film. Um, we rented it at a lot of the video store. It was always checked out. 
Um, it's a movie that if a kid, if it clicks with a kid, they don't watch it just once. They watch it 30, 40 times. It becomes something to put on a loop, you know. And I totally get that. I totally get that. I'd like to pick up the novel now just to see how different it is because it says that the the movie ends at about the halfway point of the novel and that there's more to story. And I'm sure they use some of that as fodder for two, but, you know, we'll get to that at some point. Yeah, good movie. Should check it out. Another 80s classic. Uh, another one of, hey, another film from 1984 along with Ghostbusters. Like, look at all those amazing movies that came out in 1984. Um Hey, thanks for uh, checking out the show this this time. Hope you dug the review of Never Ending Story. It is a uh, a movie worth checking out if you haven't. Uh, I'm jealous. I'd like to watch it again for the first time. But uh, I will watch it a few more times before my uh, Amazon Prime wears off. Oh, my gosh. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. We hit number one this week. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we hit number one on the Podomatic Film and TV listings. Unbelievable. Fantastic. Thank you. I knew it would be short-lived. We're now at number three. But that's okay because everybody gets to be king of the mountain just once, you know. I'm sure we'll hit it again at some point, and it's always cool when that happens. Uh, we got some more reviews on iTunes. We're up to 38. If you've got a couple of minutes, uh, head over to iTunes and leave us a review. It doesn't cost you anything, and it helps our iTunes search results. At least that's what I'm told. Uh, you can check out our Patreon page, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Look up 91 Reasons on Patreon. Uh, this show was sponsored by Michael, Michael Bondi. So you can sponsor a show and pick a movie and hear me wax poetically for nearly an hour about it. Why not? Why not, right? Uh, we had a great time at WonderCon. This Friday, we're going to Star Wars Celebration. I'll be on Chris Gore's Star Wars panel at 12 noon in the same exact room he had his panel at WonderCon. So two weeks later, I go from the audience to the panel. I am moving on up, folks. Hopefully, uh, Chris has said, I will be able to grab some of the audio from that to make an episode for those of you that can't make the show. Uh, to everyone who said hi at WonderCon, it is great that you're listening. Thank you so much. Uh, it is truly humbling to walk into a room of that many people and have more than a few recognize uh, the logo and me from the show. And we made a lot of new friends. Last episode was the Popzilla Back to the Future art show coming up in May. And that's um, Sam and Ryan, who I met at the show. I met Sam and bought some art. So con's a great place to make new friends. You're never too old to make new friends. And you're never too old to continue the story. And in this case... I am the voice Jeff Tucker, and the story that you're listening to that seems to never end, if you ask my wife, I never stop talking, and that story is called 91 Reasons. reasons please subscribe and leave a review on itunes find us on facebook is anyone even still listening <laughs> now i see why you picked this cat
I think I know what it was. Tell us more. Near my home, there used to be a beautiful lake. But then, then it, it was gone. Did the lake dry up? No, it just wasn't there anymore. Nothing was there anymore. Not even a dried up lake. A hole? A hole would be something. No, it was nothing. And it got bigger and bigger. First, there was no lake anymore. And then finally, no rocks. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah.